Well, welcome everybody. We are so excited to have you all here. Um, it's always a little strange for us to not be able to interact with you, but we are very grateful that you're all here with us this evening. My name is Heather Chamberlain. I am your mental health services coordinator, and I am very excited to introduce you to the panel that we have with us tonight. So I'm just gonna kind of go through um, each person that's on my screen in the order that they're on my screen. Um, and then they will just remind you um, throughout the presentation of their role in the district. So um, first we have Brenda Rachels. She is one of our breakthrough counselors. We have Amy Kirksey. She is a high school counselor. Um, Rebecca Stalmar, Rebecca Cook. Um, she is uh, another one of our breakthrough counselors. We have Tracy Rosenthal. She is a middle school counselor. Katie Berry is an elementary counselor. And then we are very pleased to have some of our student district advisory committee members with us tonight. Elise Jones, she's a junior at Newberry Park High School. Uh, Catherine Shu, she is a junior at Westlake High School. And Jenna Nauman, a junior at Newberry Park High School. So we're going to get started tonight. The goals for tonight are really they're, they're threefold. One is we want to re-emphasize the importance of our partnership with students and with families, um, between staff and students and families. Um, it is so important at this point in time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about some of the trends and the new data points that we are looking at and that we are concerned about as mental health professionals. And then our panel is going to talk about some of the supports that we have in place um, for you to uh, access during this time. Um, let's just begin with the partnership. I think one thing that this has taught us, um, this last 10 months has taught us, is the importance of our interdependence. Um, perhaps more than ever, we as school staff and employees are dependent upon um, families, upon parents, upon guardians, upon you students sometimes um, to help us know what is going on with students because we don't get to see you every day. When kids are on campus, there are lots of eyes and ears on um, students. And so if a teacher um, notices a change in mood or a change in body language of a student, they can check in very easily with that student. They can connect that student with their school counselor. Um, we There are multiple people on campus that students are interacting with, coaches and campus supervisors. And really that helps build a mental health safety net for students. And what we have seen is an erosion of that mental health safety net for a lot of our students. And perhaps one of the most significant pieces of that safety net that's been eroded is the lack of interaction um, among students and between students. Peers serve as almost a built-in support system for each other. And so when peers are not able to connect in person to talk about the ups and downs of life, to talk about um, you know, their disappointments, to process their thoughts, it really does create this, um, this vulnerable place for a lot of our students. Um, so what we want to petition um, for tonight, or we want to encourage you tonight to do is to really, um, it involve us if you have concerns about your mental health, involve us if you have concerns about your friend's mental health, involve us if you have concerns about your child's mental health, um, because we feel um, sometimes that we're kind of on the outside waiting. And um, so, which is why I put this, this graphic up tonight. Um, we know that we are seeing the tip of the iceberg um, based upon some of the data that comes across our desks and um, some, unfortunately, some of the situations by the time they get to us, they have become so acute and so severe that we are 
playing catch up. And, and really, there's a lot of things that we can do prevention wise um, to help support you and prevent you from having to get to a place of really high acuity with your mental health. And I just need to tell you all, I always prepare something and then I never stick to script. And so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so let's just talk about some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, so um, some of the mental health trends we're seeing that give way to these concerns about mental health are really connected to this isolation that we find ourselves in. We're all kind of required to live these new lives that really are limiting our interaction with other people. Uh, last November, uh, the Journal of the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Psychiatry conducted a systemic review of 83 um, research studies. And all of these research studies were focused upon the effects of isolation on children and teens. And what this review found is that isolation significantly increases the risk of depression. And I know sometimes we talk a lot about anxiety, um, but I really think during this period of time, we really need to be paying some extra attention to the risks of depression. What these, this study also found is that it's possible that isolation can increase risk of anxiety, but really, um, it concluded that it's more likely to increase risks of depression. And it's more likely to increase these risks um, even among students who have never had struggles with their mental health before, among kids who have never really had to consider um, their mental health or some of the challenges that co-occur with that. Um, in California, um, between the years of 2016 and 2018, they began collecting some data on emergency room visits. And what we've what they found is consistently increases in emergency room visits among kids between the ages of 12 and 17 for really high risk behaviors, suicidal ideation, intentional self-harm. Um, what we have found is that the, um, the number of students that are requiring hospitalization or emergency department visits is increasing. And during normal school years, um, my partner, um, her name is Bethany Stern, she's a school psychologist, she's not with us tonight, but she and I often will be able to just kind of keep track of these students, you know, in our heads. This year we've had to, to start um, a spreadsheet because we couldn't keep track of the number of students that we're hearing about um, who are becoming hospitalized. And we know that this, the number that we are aware of is probably less than the actual number because we're very dependent upon families informing us of what's happening. And I know that sometimes that is a really hard step for families to take. And so we just want to encourage you that if your child is experiencing mental health to the degree mental health issues to the degree that they are requiring visits to the emergency department, visits to, um, you know, to the hospital to reach out to your school counselor. We're going to keep that information confidential, but we want to be in a position to support you and to support your students. The other thing that I wanted to talk about to you that is a, a data point that we've been paying a lot of attention to is our risk assessment process. So during the 2018 to 2019 school year, we did 276 risk assessments across our school district. And what risk assessments do is they help us identify students who are struggling and, and pinpoint some of the things that they are struggling with psychologically. And then they put those students on our radar and so we can follow up and provide supports. Last year, we only did 119 um, risk assessments. And this year, we've only done 46, which puts us on track to maybe complete about 90 risk assessments. Um, what concerns me us about this data is that we know that the risk associated with our students hasn't suddenly disappeared because they're no longer on campus. 
what concerns us is that we're no longer aware of which students require our support. And so um, we really are paying some close attention to this information also. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to our first, um, our first panelist. It is Katie Berry. She's one of our elementary school counselors. So Katie, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, I'm Katie Berry. I'm one of the elementary counselors. And I just wanted to give a quick overview of what we offer throughout all of our elementary schools. The first thing is a social emotional learning curriculum that um, we have been able to produce lessons, um, video lessons uh, and, and PowerPoint lessons for teachers to give in the classroom um, because we are not able to be in the classroom with our students. So this has worked out well for our blended and our remote students. They are getting the same curriculum across the board and um, we're starting to see some really amazing results um, just from starting in September. So that's that's really exciting for us. Um, and our, our counselors, um, we have multiple school sites. So we are either on campus one or two days a week and when we are on campus, we are available for one-on-one -on -one counseling, small group counseling. Um, we do some other classroom lessons, uh, happens to be a lot of community circles to create that community in the classroom and working on social skills because it's elementary school and we all can work on our social skills all the time. Um, we also have Zoom sessions. So most of my one-on-one -on -one sessions are it, through Zoom so that we are not interrupting students um, in their instructional time because it's so short this year. And if it is in, in person, we are doing it outside. So we've had a lot of nice outside um, discussions with some of our students. Um, and we're also, of course, here for any crisis situation and um, red flag warnings. We, we, we get those, we work with our kids, we work with our principals to, um, to get the proper supports for those students. So thank you for being here. Oh, and... Um, our, this is just a list of all of us. <laughs> so uh, take a moment, uh, find your student's school and, and the corresponding counselor, our information is there. Uh, we also have a school social worker who works at our Title I schools um, and, and works a lot with our outreach. Hi everyone, um, I am Tracy Rosenthal and I am a middle school counselor at Redwood Middle School. So um, we, I'm gonna piggyback a lot on what Katie had said. We are very fortunate, we're actually on campus as well and our counselors have, uh, we have students both blended and remote. And so we've been lucky to have some students actually on campus. So when we're able to, we can do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. And it's always been, it been great to be able to do that. But the remote students, we are actively doing Zoom lessons, Zoom um, meetings as well. Um, as Katie also mentioned, we are doing a lot of following up on those red flag warnings. Our students, most of our students, if not all, are issued our Chromebooks through the district. And through that, we are able to identify students who may have um, Googled a word or a phrase or something that could trigger some, trigger uh, us to be involved. And so we take that very seriously and we follow up on all of those. And I have to say that has been extremely helpful. And I can tell you our parents, the ones that we've done this with are extremely grateful because they are not with those students 24 seven when they're online. And a lot of this happens while they're not in class. So, you know, even though the, the, the parent may be monitoring them while they're in class, once they're off, they are still continuing to use the computer. So that has been amazing. Um, we also, for middle schoolers, it's a very, uh, it's probably the hardest because they are so social and we do encourage social, you know, social being to be around each other, but that's not an option at this point but we have um, online school clubs for them. So that is one of our ways of helping to encourage their socialization. Um, and then we have a lot of referrals that we're able to offer for our students. Our wellness counselors are able to offer that Zoom one-on-one um, -on -one weekly counseling sessions for our students. And I can tell you, we are utilizing our wellness counselors a lot. 
We also continue to use our teen outreach workers from the teen center. And of course, we always have our community therapeutic resources that we utilize and give access to our families. But the one thing I do wanna stress is we are there, we are here. Whether your student is remote or blended, we are just an email or a phone call away. So please, if you see there's anything that you feel, something just doesn't feel right to you, your student's not the same, please reach out, okay? We really encourage you and we really want you to do that. Thank you. And again, the next slide is a list of all of our middle school counselors. So if you like, you can always try to find your school counselor on there. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Amy Kirksey and I am one of the high school counselors. I'm a counselor for Westlake High School. And tonight I'm, I'm grateful to be able to represent high school counseling across um, all of our high schools. So, I will also piggyback on what Ms. Barry and Ms. Rosenthal said. Um, very similar, um, also different, just because we're working with our older students. Um, our counselors are also, we have um, five counselors at every site for um, the three main high schools. And counselors are available daily for our students um, on campus, as well as via Zoom, um, phone, really any way to get a hold of us. Um, all, all of our high schools, we have we offer an open counseling Zoom um, that allows the students to drop in whenever we have that open. Um, we have breakout rooms available for all of the counselors. So if we happen to have a, a lot of students come in on that day, then we're able to go ahead and meet with each of them. Um, we do continuous follow-up just as the middle school and elementary school for those students who we identify um, or who are shared with us that have some um, greater academic and or social emotional needs. Um, we have continuous follow-up and each of the high schools have their own way of doing that. Um, we also do our best to provide opportunities and resources for students to promote that school involvement. Um, as we all know, high school students are not back on campus right now. Um, there's some small populations that are, but for the most part, our, our general population is not. And so for that reason, it's even more critical and important that we are helping our students to um, feel like they belong to our high school, especially those ninth grade students who haven't been able to step foot on our campus. So we're really doing our best um, through also online clubs and um, lots of communication coming at them through Instagram and all these different ways of reaching out. Um, the referrals, this is, we couldn't do, we couldn't do our jobs without our amazing referrals and resources that we have within our district and in the community. So similar to middle school, we have our campus wellness program, our wellness counselors. Um, we have one counselor at each of our sites and um, it's amazing. Our students are able to have that one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with them weekly. Um, great check-ins and um, just ability to have an extra pair of arms around those students. We also utilize our youth outreach program through the Conejo Park and Rec. Um, that, that resource provides academic and social emotional support. And we also have our breakthrough, our amazing breakthrough student assistance program, which you guys will learn a little bit more about in just a, a couple of slides, I believe. Um, that's been an amazing um, support and resource for our students. And then we also have a variety of community resources, um, which is just an amazing support for us high school counselors. And I will just go ahead and, and Ms. Rosenthal, you said it best that uh, we just wanna remind our students, we wanna remind our parents, families, guardians that um, your high school counselors are here at all times. And, and we, um, we don't feel that any concern is too small to be reached out about. So, utilize our emails um, and that's that's the next slide for you. Um, pop into our open Zooms at each of our sites, uh, contact our counseling support staff at each of the sites. They know how to get a hold of us um, at any time and they're not afraid to do so and we appreciate that. Um, so this slide's a little bit bigger just because we have our, or a little bit more dense just because we have some more high school counselors, but it goes by high school and not to forget Century Academy as well as Canal Valley High School. So thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and I completely forgot to say this at the beginning. Please 
enter any questions that you have into the Q&A section. We received a lot of questions in advance, um, but if you have questions that come up, we will do our best to try and get those answered at the Q&A section at the end. So I see a few questions have been entered, but please, you know, please enter those questions and we will try to get to them. Um, so I would like to share with you a little bit more about Breakthrough and what it is that we do. Um, we are an additional system of support that exists within the CVUSD school community. And um, we are a resource available to all CVUSD students, kindergarten through 12th grade and their families. I kind of always refer to Breakthrough as an additional layer of support that um, complements the amazing resources that you just heard about that are happening at our school sites. Uh, Breakthrough has been part of CVUSD for nine years. And really what we do is we provide education, prevention, early identification, um, intervention, referrals to outside resources and resources within our schools, as well as short-term brief um, individual and group counseling for students. So um, a few ways that students get to us, uh, board policy stipulates that students who are suspended for alcohol, marijuana, other drugs, um, and or violence are automatically referred to the breakthrough program, but we also accept concerned based referrals. So those are referrals um, just based on uh, someone's concern for a student um, that they might have a barrier to being in su uh, successful in school. So that might be um, substance abuse issues. It could be attendance issues, mental health concerns. Um, and about 40% of our referrals are concern based. Um, so we do get some of those, you know, disability based referrals, but we also get a lot of concern based referrals. Anyone can make a referral to Breakthrough. Most of our referrals are coming from our administrators and our counselors at school sites, um, but we also get referrals from teachers, from coaches. Um, parents can make referrals for their child if they feel like they need that additional layer of support. Um, we have even had students who self refer. So anyone can make a referral. What's unique about our program is regardless of the reason for referral, all of our families are offered what we call a BRIM, um, which is a family conference. And um, it's just a set of structured questions that we ask um, students and families when they come in for our meeting to help us hear their story, to help us identify like strengths, um, as well as areas of concern and needs that um, for that particular family. Then like collaboratively with the family, we come up with a plan that will help, um, you know, we kind of build upon the strengths and also um, help address them to just navigate the school system safely and successfully. A lot of times too, we're referring out to resources within our community for mental health, for food, um, for recreation, for tutoring, different things like that. So we kind of act as that bridge between families and resources within our schools, as well as resources within our communities. Um, and just like the other counselors, uh, we we have our contact information up here. Um, there's two of us um, and we are located at the um, district office. So we have a centralized confidential program here at the district office. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about Breakthrough. Um, one of the great things about a student assistance program is we are able to kind of shift and adjust as, as needed and um, you know, last March when we went into remote learning, um, we realized that we needed to have some additional resources for students and families. And one of those that we um, created this year is the CVSD Wellness Room. And what that is, is just a space for students and parents um, to come and, you know, it has different mindfulness activities, coloring activities, some kind of things that might be fun and distracting, like looking at the San Diego Zoo. Um, we also posted our recent uh, assembly that was for our middle and high school students with Dee Hankins, who's a motivational speaker and who's talking about resilience, that's posted there. There are resources for students to get support. So it's just a place for students to go that is just a hub of different resources that allows them to maybe relax a little, refocus if they need a break or um, to calm down if they're feeling stressed out. So when you visit the CVUSD website um, and you scroll down under the reopen and redesign, there is a um, button that says CVUSD wellness room. And when you click that button, it will take you to our wellness room um, to access those resources. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to go check it out. I was very um, 
listening to some of the music and doing some of the activities when I was creating it. And, you know, uh, Mrs. Rachel's, Brenda Rachel's and I worked on this and there are some really great activities um, to just help, you know, you to relax and, and to take a break. So one other um, resource that we found was necessary was really having a place where we could have coordinated uh, mental health resources. Um, so a group of counselors um, from different sites and different um, schools got together and we put, pulled together some resources for families just to help you be able to navigate this time um, with your students. And so what you will see is if you click on um, our web page on the social emotional support button, there are three main categories. One is for parents, um, resources and um, just things, uh, different uh, community-based organizations that you can call for support. Um, and some ideas to help your, your children with coping strategies and that kind of thing. Then we have our grade span specific resources where we broke up different activities that, that focus on a lot of different things. Uh, it could be self-esteem, it could be relaxation activities, it could be emotion management, which is um, really a big need that we are hearing from parents right now. So there are different resources there, links to different resources um, for those kinds of things under the grade span specific resources. And then finally, our community mental health resources. We just wanted to have a place where you could access all of this information um, in one, one location. Thank you. My name is Brenda Rachels and I'm one of the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program counselors um, here at the district office. And we just wanted to remind all of our families that um, CDSD recognizes right now that students and families are facing additional challenges and the need for social emotional support has increased greatly. Um, we're committed to serve our students and families. Um, through mental health access remotely through our support line and also our request an appointment button. Um, if you go what Dr. Chamberlain was just showing that burgundy button on the, the caneousd.org homepage, you'll see social emotional support and mental health resources, that burgundy button, you click on it and you'll be taken to a place that shows both the CDUSD support line phone number as well as a link that you can click on to schedule an appointment at your convenience. Um, our CDSD support line is manned by a, a bilingual staff person who's available Monday through Friday, and there's the phone number. It's only on a school days from 8.30 to 4 p.m. Or if right now, you can actually take your phone and put it up to the screen for the, the QR code and be able to get that link directly to the um, request an appointment and go ahead and set that up at a later time, like I said, when it's convenient for you. Um, through this process, once you get connected, you're going to get, um, you're, you're going to get connected with a counselor that you can share your concerns with. Um, and just be able to share your heart, what's going on with your student and your family, and, and they'll be able to do a quick assessment and figure out whether or not you might be a better fit for some outside community resources or whether or not they can do some short-term social-emotional counseling and support for your student. So just to summarize, we know we've probably given you a lot of information this evening. Um, just know that CVUSD is here to provide supports to your students, social emotional supports and mental health supports through our counselors, through our breakthrough program, 
for our wellness counselors. Wellness counselors help support the secondary counselors by meeting with students um, on a weekly basis, um, our virtual wellness room, our mental health web page, and then our support line. So now, Becca, will we take questions? Okay, so that part concludes our presentation of all of our uh, mental health supports that we offer in-house at um, our CDSD school district. And we're gonna move into the Q&A portion. So we received a lot of questions ahead of time that we have gone through and um, are going to address. And we appreciate that the questions are still coming in. I can see them. And so we're gonna get to as many as we can. So um, we'd like to start out with our first question. And I was, um, Dr. Chamberlain, I was wondering if you could maybe share with our students and families how can parents help their kids that are struggling with anxiety? I am so glad that this question was asked because there are so many things that you can do for anxiety. The problem is, is that when you're struggling with anxiety, you really don't feel like doing any of them. So the first thing that I want to say is really encourage your child um, to take a baby step. It might just be taking a five minute walk outside. Um, you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by all the things with, you know, breathing exercises and meditations and exercising, all of these things that we know are really good for managing anxiety, but we need to just have a starting place. And so what I would say is um, look through the resources that we have on our website, maybe choose one or two activities out of the wellness room. But I really think one of the key um, benefits for students right now is just getting them away from their screens for a few minutes outside and doing some sort of activity and make it fun. I mean, it doesn't need to be, you know, the family's going to do, you know, a half marathon. It's, you know what, we're going to take a walk together around the block. Um, just little things and then start to build on those little steps, make a plan and, you know, um, encourage one another. And then, of course, always trying to keep that open line of communication. If your child is communicating to you their anxiety, you've already um, jumped over one of the biggest hurdles. So now your job is to then just start encouraging and supporting your, your child. And Dr. Chamberlain, you bring up a good point with starting with something small because part of some of the fallout of, it, of anxiety is that you just feel so overwhelmed that you don't want to even do anything. So having that small piece to start with and maybe not something really big, I love that. Um, Ms. Jenna, could you please share with us right now what Dr. Chamberlain was saying is right, right now our lives are centered so much around screens and, and that's part of participating in like social, school, any work. Um, what are some things that parents and students could do to like get off their screen and have some fun? Yeah, so I mean, I totally get that as a student being online and everything, you just feel like no matter where you go, the school's still with you because you have your laptop with you when you go somewhere to try to do something. So I've really tried to dedicate a lot of time personally to spending time outside and getting around and doing something that I like. So um, like personally, I love spending time with animals. So I've figured out a way to volunteer at a horse stables that's nearby. Um, but I know I have friends who love running and so they go on runs every day. And we, like all my friends and everything just find that that time outside is so valuable that it really grounds you and makes you feel a little more connected to everything that you're doing. Um, there's also all sorts of little things that I know a ton of students and my friends and myself enjoy doing, which include playing like board games and stuff. And even if you want to play with your friends, you can do something over Zoom that's like a virtual game. And it doesn't feel like schoolwork being on your computer because it's totally different. Um, I also personally love doing a ton of crafts. So I do a lot of sewing. And whenever I start just like feeling burned out on school and I don't wanna do that last assignment that I have, I take a break and go do some sewing, go do some coloring, something like that, 
just little things throughout the day to kind of keep myself motivated. Yeah, those breaks probably help being built in to your between all of your different assignments. Definitely, yeah. Miss Barry, can you share with us maybe a little bit about um, for parents with everything being remote and like we were talking about with friends and school being on screens, like where do how do parents set boundaries around that? Any suggestions? Sure. So I. I I look at things from the elementary point of view. So <laughs> I apologize if that's not where you're at. Um, but I think one of the biggest things is, you know, have, have, a, have, have a routine, whether it's a bedtime routine and you're going to turn technology off, like stick with it. Be, be that person that follows through because once your student understands that, okay, no more screen time, um, they can switch their brain to something else. Um, so uh, pick a time and everybody go off screen and, and do one of those other fun, fun things that um, were, was just suggested. Um, game nights are great, <laughs> but um, follow through. That, that stick with it and follow through is the most important thing. Awesome, thank you. And we have Catherine. Um, Catherine, I know Jenna just shared how much she likes being outside and, and exercising. How do you motivate someone to exercise, especially as a parent? What could they say to their child to kind of get them going outside and enjoying the fresh air? Yeah, sometimes it's hard to go outside um, and to want to go outside and like take a five minute walk. But once you get started and you go outside first, you're going to realize how amazing it is like being with nature and to have that break from school and like being on our screens all day. So um, the hardest part is like getting started and like taking that step outside. And something that I recommend doing is um, starting off with something that doesn't feel like exercise. So that might be like going on a hike. And like for me personally, I like went on a hike last week with a friend and we hiked to the beach. So there was like a final destination and we loved the beach. So it was really amazing to be able to like talk and it didn't feel like hiking. It felt like walking and just casually talking with a friend. So um, doing those things like that. And then also something else that works is um, dancing and participating in other activities that aren't normally like associated with exercise or physical exercise. So for example, maybe you want your child to like download a Just Dance app or go on the Wii and um, do some just dance because it's like moving your body and you're exercising, even though it doesn't feel like um, a traditional like mile run, for example. Um, then another thing that you can do is just honestly make whatever exercise you plan on doing fun um, and come up with creative ideas and try to achieve like a final destination or a um, prize at the end of like your walk, for example. Those are really good ideas. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Dr. Chamberlain, you shared at the very beginning how probably the, the biggest fallout from the pandemic we're seeing more than anxiety is depression. So what are some signs that parents can be looking for so they can um, identify whether or not their child is depressed or student as well? Yeah, you know, you, you know your children best, right? And I think what's been difficult with COVID-19 is, and I hear this over and over again from my staff and from parents, is that it's almost like this subtle blanket of apathy has kind of come to rest on us. And so um, what I would say is that sometimes depression can be subtle. Sometimes it can be a response to what's happening in our environment. But if you're at all concerned that, I would reach out, reach out to the support line, reach out to your counselor, get some different eyes on your student, um, somebody who can maybe see with fresh eyes something that you have, you have been watching slowly occur over time. You know, some of the things that we know um, are consistent with depression are feelings of hopelessness, um, not enjoying things that you used to do. Well, a lot of those things are kind of being taken away from us right now. So it makes teasing out whether or not your child is depressed, you know, with a, or 
is having a normal reaction to the situation that we find ourselves in. Regardless, I think it's really important to reach out and get, um, get some other eyes on your child. Um, another good place to start is with your primary care physician, somebody who, who knows your child, um, who can, you know, kind of take the, the, anything that you may have missed because of the subtle, subtlety of this setting in um, and, and really um, point those things out for you. Um, but I would say when in doubt, trust your gut and get, um, get some extra support. Thank you. And then Miss Elise, I'm hoping you can answer this one. Um, we had a parent that wanted to know what their child could do during COVID and volunteering. And, and do you think volunteering is important? Yeah, this is something I've, I've definitely thought about, especially this year. And I think the best way to, um, for a student to start volunteering is through their clubs at school. Um, a lot of us may not realize that, especially for freshmen, that the clubs are even still going, but they are. And they, they are fairly active. I'm in a few clubs myself, and um, they, some of them are really heavily focused on service. And so it's a great way to find these volunteer opportunities and also to, you know, have a little more social interaction. I think that's really important as well. And um, like Jenna said earlier, she, she goes to the horse stables and I think finding things in your community um, is also a really great way to volunteer because there, there are plenty of things to do. So I think just, um, looking at the resources that were there before, because they are so active and they're, um, they're trying to get more volunteers. And yeah, I think, I think volunteering is super important. And in my personal experience, it's, it's made me a lot happier and it's um, been super positive. And I think, you know, you go into volunteering trying to help other people, but it's, it's, as beneficial or even more beneficial to um, the person volunteering. So I, I really encourage students to find those clubs on campus, on campus to volunteer. It's, it's very beneficial for your, for your mental health. Miss Rachel, can I just, okay, yeah, please. Oh, I would just yeah. love to piggyback on to something that Elise shared and that is um, the volunteer opportunities that are just right on our high school campuses as well. Um, whether it's, you know, an academic peer mentor or um, tutoring for, you know, the younger students. Um, I know there's uh, many of the teachers on the campuses that are looking for, um, you know, students to assist them in different ways that would give back to just our own school community. And um, one of the benefits of that too is just feeling like a part of our school community. Um, so there's amazing resources obviously out in the community, but just right on our own campus, I would say all the high schools definitely have opportunities for students to give up their time and give back to the school, which I think you know makes everyone's hearts feel better. So just wanted to add that. And this is Kirksey. If we have parents on here, students that are interested and in looking into clubs, should they contact um, someone in activities or their school counselor or yeah. is it on the That's, website or? Oh, well, I would say all the above. I think you just answered the question okay. perfectly, but we definitely as counselors have a lot of um, students and parents who will reach out to us. Um, I can speak specifically for Wessex High School and I'm pretty certain all of them have this. Um, we all have our websites and the activities website and on there it just shows all of our active um, clubs, as well as the advisors, as well as the advisors' contact information. Um, but uh, again, reach out to us counselors anytime. We can provide them with that list. Um, and then also our assistant principal of activities. And even in our government, our ASG programs, they've got a lot of that information as well, too. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have a question. Um, would like to see if we could hear from a couple people on the panel. Um, starting with Dr. Chamberlain and then um, maybe Catherine and Jenna from your perspective. I think um, Catherine, you had spoke with middle school students and Jenna, you have been back on the campus. So we, we know some of the students and parents who have their children coming back on the school campuses. 
might have some anxiety or some fears um, about the virus and being on a school campus. So how, how can we help them address that? Yes, this is a, a really good question too, because um, the fear is valid, right? You know, we are all experiencing something that we've never experienced before. So the fear is valid, but we also know that for to avoid anxiety or to avoid the things that makes make us anxious only help to feed the anxiety. And so again, it's taking those baby steps. And um, I think, you know, even if it's just, you know, going to the school parking lot after school, just, you know, to stand in the parking lot for a minute, um, just starting out with those baby steps of getting your child used to being back in that place where they were so used to going. Um, and I, I know that also, um, just from a personal perspective, when I see everything that has occurred on our campuses to ensure the safety of students, it's really reassuring. Um, the just the clean from the cleaning to the ventilation to the screenings. Um, while it's a weird way to be entering school right now, it's also um, a very reassuring way to be entering school if you are experiencing anxiety around the virus. Um, Catherine, um, did you have anything you might want to add to that? Yeah, um, I completely agree with what you said. Um, I think it really does start off with some baby steps and then slowly you're going to be more comfortable when you ease back onto campus. And then from talking to a lot of middle schoolers um, in SDAC, many mentioned how they face a lot of anxiety before returning back to campus. And um, something that they used was the wellness room and they just went on there and did, like some meditation the week before and took some time to like reflect and acknowledge their feelings and their emotions at the time. And then something else that a lot of people did was um, they reached out to a lot of their classmates and then just talked to them about like their anxiety and how they were feeling. And when you talk to someone and share like how you feel, it's really important um, because you're acknowledging like your feelings and you're talking it through and like working it out with someone who understands like how you feel. Um, and then many mentioned how after they got on campus and like saw the safety protocols and saw the socially distanced um, people and everything that was set up in place, they felt way more comfortable being in, on campus and it like eased their anxiety. And that was like the same for me as well. Like today I went on campus and I took the PSAT and I was really nervous before like going on, um, but everybody was socially distanced and um, they respected like each other's space. So that was amazing. And it made me feel way more comfortable. So really adding on to what everybody else has already been saying about this, um, and especially what Catherine was saying around her experience with the PSAT, um, I'm in student government at Newbury Park, and we did a few pilot classes for about two months. We went onto campus twice a week and met in person and everything. Um, and I know a lot of my classmates, as well as myself, we had a ton of anxiety about going back and, oh, what if we catch something? What if they're not f enforcing all the rules and everything that they put in place? But right when I got there, my anxiety like lowered and lowered and lowered as I realized, okay, this is gonna be okay because everybody knows they have to be socially distanced. Everybody was respecting that and everybody was wearing their masks and everything. And it really just like restored my faith in everything. And my anxiety, I was so less worried after seeing that, okay, all these kids are respecting the guidelines and the rules that have been put in place. Um, I also got to know the campus supervisors who were taking the temperature every day when we entered through the same gate. And it kind of became a game of, uh, oh, holding up the list of all the symptoms and being like, do you have any of these? And you say no. And he's like, okay, name one of them. Um, and we just created a whole game out of it. And it was super simple, but it just, it brought a smile to my day. And while the experience of going back definitely brought up some anxiety, it was so worth it. So it sounds like once you got there, Jenna, it actually was a good thing once you overcame that, like Dr. Chamberlain was saying, like when you avoid it, it's hard and you sometimes keep running from it, but actually going in, it seemed like your anxiety kind of decreased once you got there and it was a good thing. Definitely, yeah. Okay. Lisa, I have a question for you now. 
This is from a parent who whose child was getting really good grades prior to remote learning and is just really struggling to stay motivated and engaged in school. Do you have any tips on how to stay motivated in the midst of um, remote learning? Yeah, I, I, I definitely can relate to this and um, I felt this happened to me since starting remote learning. And um, as far as parents, I think the best thing that they can do is just to be understanding. Um, you know, talking with family members, I think there's a misconception that online school is a lot easier than in person. And that's definitely right. not the case. I think it's even more stressful for students because our whole routines have been changed. Um, so I think that un being understanding of the situation is something really important for a parent to do. Um, some other things to motivate someone is um, I find having something to look forward to is super helpful. I try to, at the beginning of each week, um, when I'm planning out my week, I, I pick out something um, over the weekend that I can, um, you know, throughout the week, if I'm having a hard time, I can just say, like, oh, I can, I can push through because on Friday I... I have this fun thing or something like that, you know, I'm going to be Zooming with my friends. I try to make sure that there's something during the week that I can um, motivate myself to finish my schoolwork and just get through the week. That's, that's something small, but really, really beneficial to me. Um, and I think doing that as a family is really good as well. Having a, a little staycation in your house mm -hmm. just a game night has been mentioned before I think that would be super fun and um also um just talking with your child about certain things on their classes and being genuinely interested is something really motivating um I think that we can definitely um see that genuine interest and um like knowing the names of our teachers and asking about them and asking about what we're learning in our classes, I think that definitely keeps um, students engaged and as well as um, taking breaks outside, that is definitely a motivating thing. You know, you may feel really drained and just five minutes outside can help you to um, finish up your work. So, yeah. At least those are all really great tips. And it sounds like you, from what you said, you've, you've had to kind of establish those as you felt your own motivation kind of sliding. Yeah. It sounds like they're sure. working for you, which is awesome. Okay. Um, my next question, and just going to get two perspectives, um, one from Mrs. Kirksey and one from Jenna. Um, we know with being in remote learning, it's, it's so different. We don't have that personal connection. Um, we miss body language. It's, it's just, it feels like a barrier to some degree. Um, and so we had a parent that wrote in that said that her daughter doesn't feel connected to the teacher and feels isolated and indifferent toward assignments. So um, any tips or thoughts, Ms. Kirksey, on, on what she could do to help her daughter maybe make a relationship or? Absolutely. I, I would start by saying that that, um, thank you to that parent who um, expressed that concern. I would say that that is a very common concern that is brought to us counselors. Um, I, often, weekly, I could go ahead and say, um, I think the connection to the teachers is such a big deal. Um, you know, the fact that our students are not able to walk into a classroom right now and look at our teachers face to face and um, allow for our teachers to be able to pick up on some of those nonverbal cues that maybe are not so easy to pick up via Zoom, especially if the cameras are off or, um, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's far more distant. And so there are ways to, for our, our students to connect with our teachers. And um, though I wish I could say, you know, all of these in-person ideas right now, it really is, it takes more effort this way. And I would imagine the students on this panel would completely agree. It takes more effort. It takes, um, you know, a little bit of courage to reach out to that teacher, whether it's via email, because maybe they're too um, shy to do it in a Zoom setting at the end of class to say, 
hey, you know, Miss Rachel's, can I talk to you after class? That might be tough, but whether it's an email or something in the chat box, you know, um, a lot of our teachers do say that the students will reach out to them in the middle of a Zoom lesson, just saying, hey, can I talk to you at the end of the class? Um, you know, I really, I think about our students who um, maybe are not quite as outgoing as others or are just our ninth grade students who are not used to this whole high school experience and how do they have the courage to do it? And what I, what I would encourage the, um, the students and the parents of these students to just know is that, my goodness, everyone is in all the same place right now. Our, from our juniors that are on this panel to our freshmen who have never walked, you know, or have never stepped onto our campuses. We are all in the same boat right now. I would um, encourage them to uh, obviously maybe step out of their comfort zone a little bit and reach out to the teacher via email, just starting there. I know our teachers have virtual office hours right now. I know a lot of my students will reach out to them and maybe they don't wanna be in there with four other students, but um, I know so many of the teachers, you guys that are really missing the same connection. I would say the majority of our teachers that I've been able to connect with, they miss talking to the students. They're, they're willing to spend, you know, go above and beyond to, to take that time. So I don't know if that's helpful at all. I would say reaching out via yeah. email, really finding out those office hours um, don't be afraid to reach out to us counselors too. If maybe you don't hear back, it's because our teachers are obviously so inundated. They're very busy. Um, reach out to us. We, a lot of us, you know, as counselors do know um, the office hours of our teachers. And if we don't know, we can find that out for you guys too. Um, just remembering everyone is in the same boat right now that it really is. It just doesn't matter if you were hundred percent involved last year or you've never been involved in school. Everyone's in the same boat right now. So perspective. How about you, Jenna? You have any tips for having been in a classroom and had, having had this experience firsthand or talking with any of your friends? Yeah, so um, I can totally relate to this because in the classroom setting, I totally thrive off of having a relationship with, where my, with my teachers where I know that I can come up to them and say, hey, I'm struggling with this sort of thing. Can you help me understand this topic or something along the lines of that? And not being able to see my teachers in person and stick around after class easily and just stand by their desk and ask them a question. It's completely different doing that over Zoom as everybody's leaving the Zoom and you're kind of just like awkwardly sitting there. And um, I know that that's like totally weird and everything so and completely different, but just emphasizing what um, was already said uh, reaching out through email and even if you email them and say hey can we set up a zoom and talk about something and maybe you don't want to say what it's about or like that you're struggling with some sort of topic through the email um, just asking if you can talk with your teacher over zoom is very helpful um, also from personal experience I know that the teachers are always there and they want to help you and they want you to thrive in their class and in all your other classes and just in life in general and so just remembering that reaching out to a teacher and asking for help on some sort of assignment, if you don't understand the instructions or anything like that, that's not a burden to the teacher. The teacher loves when the students ask, reach out and say, hey, your instructions weren't quite, weren't quite clear here. Because I've learned oftentimes if one person has a question in the class, there's a few other people who maybe have the same question and just asking the questions and just being that kid who's willing to reach out and ask the question to help all the other kids in the class as well. Thank you, Jenna. So, um, Catherine, so one of the parents had written in and had asked, how can I help my child connect with peers? So I don't know what grade, but just maybe it sounds like they're having a hard time being able to keep some social relationships during this pandemic and being remote. Have any thoughts or advice on that? Yeah, right now is such a different, a difficult time to be able to interact with our peers and like our classmates. So um, this is a very valid like concern and issue that many students are facing right now. And one of the things that I would recommend like your child to do or like any student to do is like is to reach out to your counselors. Um, your counselors have a lot of resources on clubs and activities that you can get involved with, and through clubs and activities, you can meet so many amazing like peers 
I remember I went to Westlake not knowing like anybody and I met all of my friends through clubs and sports and extracurricular activities. So um, these are the places where you're going to meet your friends. Um, and then also another thing that helps is um, joining clubs. So if you go on the activities website of your school for high school, um, there are different clubs that you can like reach out to the advisor and say like, hey, can I join a meeting and um, participate in that meeting and get to know all the officers and all of the members in the club. And that's how you can meet so many people. And then um, at the elementary level, I would really recommend right now um, contacting your teachers if you ever feel like lonely because they're going to know a lot of students and um, people that you can talk to. And just adding something on to the last question, I remember um, from my personal experience, um, one time this year, I just stayed after class. I was having a really bad day and I just wanted to talk to my teacher. And it ended up being like an hour long conversation about like how my life was going and like any advice for the future so um, just never be afraid to like reach out to your teachers your counselors um, or any friends around you. Thank you Catherine. Um, we're getting really close on our time we're actually a little over we apologize um, we just had so many questions coming in so I'm going to direct the last one to um, Miss Rosenthal just to kind of close it up. And I'm gonna make it kind of a twofold question because something else came in that I think would be important. Um, one of the parents is asking how that they can support their child if they don't want counseling or help, even though they're feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. And the other part of that is um, just in, in regards to any kind of resistance. Another parent said, you know, they're having a hard time getting them to do anything. And so they're resistant to any kind of mental health. So how do you help people that are resistant to that? That's a really good question. And I get that quite often from parents. And I have to say, I'm going to go back to what Dr. Chamberlain said, you know, your child best. And if you feel that anything is off, it's time to act. And this is what I like to say to parents. If your child has a stomach ache or a toothache, you wouldn't think twice about taking them to the dentist. You wouldn't think twice about taking them to their pediatrician or to their doctor. You would take them. Odds are you're not going to ask your child, do you want to go to the dentist and get that fixed? Because if they, if you did gave them that choice, they'd say, no, I don't want to go. That hurts or that's painful. A lot of it is a fear, the stigma around therapy, the stigma around counseling. And I think if parents tell them our mental health is as important as your physical health. It is, it's part of your physical health. And it's, I am your mom, I'm your dad, I'm your guardian, I'm your grandparent, and it's my job to take care of you. And at some point, us parents have to make the hard choice and we need to step in and make that call. I can say if finding an outside therapist is too, too much too soon, start with your counselors. We have our wellness counselors. That's where I start a lot of the times. I talk to parents and then I say, let me talk to your student. And when I talk to the student, I say, I've got 50, 10 other kids at Redwood that are seeing Miss So-and-so and they love her, try it. So it seems to help when our counselors talk to our students a little bit versus the parent feeling like I'm forcing you to do something that you don't want to do. The other thing is I always say, give it three tries, give it a fair shot. Don't just go to therapy one time and say, I didn't like that person, I'm done. Give them the three tries. I can tell you once again, I have referred students to our wellness counselors, both of them, we have two, we've been fortunate enough to have two. I say, I actually say, give it two tries, but I was told, give it three tries. Not one of my students have said, I don't wanna go back. They just need to get over that hump. And once they do and they realize it's okay, it's not, this isn't a shameful thing. It's something that needs to be addressed. So if you as a parent feel there's a need, you need, call us, we'll help you through that process. Thank you. Tracy, Ms. Rosenthal, I mean, you're just gonna close up exactly what you said with we, as a parent, you know your child the best. Yes. And if we could just reiterate over and over, we will that we are here for you and your student. We want you to reach out. If we are not able to give you what you need, we will refer you on to a community agency, resources that are here in Caneo Valley that are specialized in 
can offer you intensive support. So please reach out to someone. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to answer all the questions that were submitted tonight and there were some great ones. I wish there was more time, um, but tonight's presentation was recorded. It'll be posted in a few days on the um, Conejo USD YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to walk through that. And I think we're going to have a copy of the PowerPoint that's going to be emailed out tomorrow that if you had signed up through Zoom, we'll get that out to you as well. Um, I just also want to thank all of our presenters tonight. Um, they were all wonderful. They bring different areas of experience and perspective. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And um, the last thing is, just want to remind you that, you know, with our parent workshops, we try to have those on a regular basis. Our next one is in February, and it's going to be with Dr. Holly Altiero. And she's going to be presenting on screen time usage and the impact on adolescent, adolescent brain development and technology addiction. Um, so you'll be getting that information sent out to you. Um, the parents will be, as well as will be posted on CVUSD social media accounts. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you then and, and having a new conversation. But again, reach out if you feel like you need that extra support and um, we'll be here. Um, thank you again for attending tonight and have a wonderful week and evening. Thank you.